Let's open our Bibles to Luke chapter 18. You're probably wondering what in the world's going on now. Well, we're studying the book of Matthew. We've taken a rabbit trail to the Gospel of John. Five chapters in John that are omitted from the Matthew passage. We're talking about Jesus' exhortation for prayer. He tells his disciples, until you, now you've asked nothing in my name, ask and you will receive. And then you should ask the Father. And he's exhorting them about their prayer life, one that was pretty much non-existent until after the ascension. And so he's exhorting them. And so we've taken a little bit of time just to talk about prayer. Two weeks ago today, we talked about prayer, and I gave you the first five of ten points, things that you should pray for. And these are things that you wouldn't naturally think about. Uh, most of the time when we pray, we have our own list. And, you know, we pray for our meal, we pray for our paycheck, we pray for our kids, you know, or whatever other things you might have on your mind. But there are some things that I wanted to highlight to you that are sometimes off the radar, and we'll be looking at some of those today. But for our focus, let's look at Luke chapter 18. Jesus is emphasized in his prayer life in the Gospel of Luke. And so as we're looking at the four Gospels, one of the things we notice about Luke is that, for example, in Matthew it says Jesus picked his disciples. In Luke it says, and when Jesus had prayed, he picked his disciples. In another Gospel we'll read, and the Spirit of God descended as a dove and rested upon Jesus after his baptism. And Luke says, and when Jesus was praying, the Spirit of God descended as a dove. So Luke emphasizes the prayer life of Jesus more than any of the other four gospel writers. And so taking some time on prayer, and in this context, Jesus gives us some instruction on prayer, and I'll bring this to uh, a focus for us outside of the natural context, but I think will be meaningful to you as you see. Then he spoke a parable to them that men ought always to pray and not to lose heart. Saying, there was a certain city, uh, in a certain city, a judge who did not fear God nor regard man. Now, there was a widow in that city and she came to him saying, get justice for me from my adversary. And he would not for a while. But afterward, he said within himself, Though I do not fear God nor regard man, yet because this widow troubles me, I will avenge her, lest by her continual coming she weary me. The Lord said, Hear what the unjust judge said. And shall God not avenge his own elect who cry out day and night to him, though he bears long with them? I tell you that he will avenge them speedily. Nevertheless, when the Son of Man comes, will he really find faith on the earth? Now, the idea of this parable is, of course, perseverance in prayer. He uses the illustration of this wicked guy uh, to say, look, if you come often enough, finally this guy will cave in. Now, it's not that we have to pray over and over and over again to get God's attention because God hears the prayers of the righteous. It's that we are being taught that we should persevere in prayer. Why? Well, we have a tendency to pray, and if things don't get fixed the way we want them fixed, we fix them ourselves. That's the way we do it in the West especially because we have money, we have talents, we have communication tools, whatever we need, whatever we want, we think we can fix it, so we will do it ourselves. and you know, we have the excuse, well, I prayed about it, and God apparently wanted me to do it myself. Now, I admit there are some things that God probably does want us to do ourselves, but the idea here that we have to keep in mind is that the Lord is wanting to teach us to be dependent on him continually go before him in prayer. Don't depend on yourself. Don't depend on your own strength. 
depend on the Lord. Be persistent in prayer. Verse 9. Also, he spoke this parable to some who trusted in themselves that they were righteous and despised others. Two men went up to the temple to pray, one a Pharisee and the other a tax collector. The Pharisee stood and prayed thus with himself. God, I, I, when I read this, I always think about um, uh, the way his voice probably sounded. It's the men of God voice, which I prefer when reading this. And so he said, God, <laughs> it's just, I can't help myself. It's, I thank you that I'm not like other men, extortioners, unjust, adulterers, or even as this tax collector. I fast twice a week. I give tithes of all that I possess. You know, oh, glory in me, Lord. That's kind of his disposition. The tax collector standed afar off and would not so much as raise his eyes to heaven, but beat his breast, saying, God, be merciful to me, a sinner. I tell you, this man went, this man went down justified to his house, or went to his house justified, rather than the other. For everyone who exalts himself will be humbled. But he who humbles himself will be exalted. And so, as much as we are called to be persevering in prayer, we're also to be humble in prayer. And when we humble ourselves in prayer, it will cause us to be more persevering. Because we say, God, I know that I can't fix this. Therefore, I trust you. And again, I want to reemphasize that God does not act based on our often praying per se, or that we build up a certain level of prayer, and then God says, okay, now you've done it, I'll answer. No, it is that he wants us to be humbly dependent on him. He wants us to trust in him. He wants to do great and mighty things that we will give him the credit and glory for, rather than giving credit and glory to ourselves. And so as we continue working our way through this list, I want to re-emphasize to you that we are to be a people of prayer. It's something that is natural for the Christian because we are humble in the presence of God. Like this guy that went as a tax collector, we apply that to the salvific message where we're talking about coming into the presence of God and saying, I'm a sinner and I need a savior. And there is absolutely an intentional uh, message there within the text. But the idea of being humble in the presence of God in all things and continuing to learn that we are dependent upon him, entirely dependent upon him, and we therefore go into his presence and on a regular basis submit our needs, our requests, intercessions, prayer for others before the Lord as a part of our re regular Christian expression. And so we looked at five things two weeks ago today. I'm just going to quickly review the first five, and then we'll dig in a little further on the latter five for today. Number one, we were instructed to pray for the peace of Jerusalem. And that's not something that you would naturally do as a believer. Some people that have come to grow in their knowledge of the Bible uh, and understand these doctrines would come to pray for the peace of Jerusalem because they have found a couple of verses in the Bible that do indicate that. And yet there's a theme throughout the entirety of the Bible, even as much as there's not this direct injunction, pray for the peace of Jerusalem, repeated over and over and over again in the Bible. But rather, it is there that we should see it, know it, know that God has chosen Israel, that that land is his. He's put his name there. Jerusalem, the capital city of the world, effectively, uh, not so much recognized today, but will be in days to come. And has never ceased to be the apple of his eye. His eye is constantly on Israel and upon Jerusalem. And we are told to pray for the peace of Jerusalem. Number two. Only one time in the New Testament, really, are we given this injunction. There's one allusion and one direct 
uh, injunction, and that is to pray for the souls of men, or the salvation of souls and the growth of the church. It seems odd that we don't have all kinds of injunctions to pray for souls. Uh, and yet, really, there's only one verse in the entire New Testament that directly tells you to pray for the souls of men. The one that we cited was an allusion to it. The Lord's not slack concerning his promise related to our prayer for the souls of those that will be saved. And then there is an injunction that we'll look at later today uh, to pray for the souls of all men. So we should be praying for people. Now that one, that seems to be our main prayer list. For most people, that's the constant prayer. God, pray, uh, pray for Johnny and I pray for you know uh, Martha, whatever. Uh, it's Henry and Martha, actually, for the record, if you're interested. Uh, but uh, uh, somebody asked me the other day, who's Martha's husband? I said, well, it's Henry. Henry. You know, so th is there any Henrys in this church? See? Told you. It's good. No Marthas either, usually. And if you're a Henry or a Martha, you're exempt because it's all fictitious. We're just having fun. Number three, that we may know our hope and calling in the Lord. We should know the hope that we have in Christ. That is something that we are in, uh, instructed to pray for. Uh, Paul says it in indirectly when he tells us he prays for the church in that way. Number four, for sound doctrine and the health of the church. Doctrine is no longer popular. Uh, in fact, it's avoided. Uh, many people think doctrine is divisive. Uh, no, I would say on the contrary. Doctrine, doctrine brings unity. When we know what we believe and we can agree together on what we believe, we have unity. Everything else is a false unity, like we're seeing in the Olympics. This is just another expression, even though it's athletic in nature, and I'm not condemning athletics. Uh, it's another method by which the world comes together as one, just as Nimrod would have had it, uh, the Babylonian spirit. And it's uh, still coming, and we'll see it uh, again in the future. So we pray for sound doctrine. And finally, uh, and I left off with this two weeks ago, that we would have healthy fellowship, healthy community. We're a community of believers. You know, we fellowship with each other. And of course, in my context, I have a, a little community. That little community is the staff. And we meet together on uh, a daily basis in the morning. We pray together. We study the Bible together from 9 to 9.30 every morning in my office. And uh, so that's our little small group. And so we have community. We get to know each other uh, on a more intimate level in that room. And, of course, that's a big focus for me is the healthiness of our staff. And then you guys have small groups. Some of you are involved in a small group. You should be involved in a small group if you're not already. And we'll have the small group fair coming up. We'll also be looking for new small group leaders. And so you'll want to communicate with Bub about that as uh, the next couple of weeks transpire but you know you've got your women's ministries Lou's teaching a class Brenda's teaching a class uh, we've got activities we've got our men's ministries we've got all kinds of things going on around here home bible studies and groups that meet here in the church and youth groups and those are little communities and we love to see people have that kind of community the sense of real transparency and real healthy interaction with each other where you can confess your faults one to another, pray for one another, not be criticized by each other, and be built up in the faith. And we have a tendency these days to kind of be standoffish because we don't want people to know who we really are, you know, because if they really knew what I was all about, they probably wouldn't like me, you know, or like me, you sometimes learn to be a bit standoffish because you've gone through so much and you wonder who's going to hurt me next, you know, somebody will stab you in the back, and leadership is tough, and uh, so you have this tendency to sort of try to be a bit protective, um, and well, there is a place for a certain level of uh, discernment, and we'll talk about that before the day is over, it's not healthy for me to be lacking in transparency, it's not healthy for me to want to uh, keep people away. And I have to admit, it was a great lesson for Brenda and for me this past weekend. You know, here we go from Candlelight in Coeur d'Alene, Idaho, to Candlelight in Longmont. I'm thinking, I, you know, I, I, I want to keep a certain distance. 
And so we end up getting there, and all of a sudden everything changes because now it's not a group of people you don't know. Now you're looking in the eyes of a hungry soul. That changes everything. Now it's not an invisible or unknown named face, uh, non-recognizable, but it's a human. And then I'm caving in. So is Brenda. And the next thing you know, we're in love with these people. And we care about them. And we see that they're hungry for pastoral leadership. They, they feel like they're, you know, I don't know, uh, abandoned children. You know, and they, they're so desperate for connection and for a covering and for some authority in their life. And then Brenda and I got in the car to drive away and cried. Because we saw these people as sheep without a shepherd. And so hungry and so needy. See, that was something that I learned in that little experience that I hope will help me be a better pastor to you. Community. You know, if we can just start to learn and care for each other, and even here uh, in this room, you think you know each other. When you say hi to somebody, tell them your name. You know, and take two seconds out of your life to get to know them. Look them in the eye. Uh, other than doing what we have a tendency in our culture to do. How you doing? Good. We don't even think about How you doing? Bad. Oh, that's nice. <laughs> because we're pre-programmed, right? And so we will have better community. Let's move on. Number six. That our love might abound. Paul told the Philippians, in this I pray. He's praying for them that your love may abound still more and more in knowledge and all discernment and that you may approve the things that are excellent, that you may be sincere and without offense till the day of Christ, being filled with the fruits of righteousness which are by Jesus Christ to the glory and praise of God. And so that our love might abound. And when iniquity abounds, the love of many wax cold. And we're still a people where we look around and we see iniquity. And I just confessed to you that when I see it, when I get hurt, uh, there's problems that make me to kind of want to recoil. And that, that is a lack of love on my part because love is others-centered, not self-centered. See? And so for me to be protective of myself, I'm not going to get too close, you know. That's me protecting myself so that I can't get hurt, so that I can't get hurt. We're all insecure, you guys. We're all insecure. And for us to be able to be transparent and care for one another is an incredibly beautiful thing. And in these days in which we live, all the more we need to love each other because we're going to need each other. Amen? And so Paul says that we should pray that our love may abound. And guys, this includes in our homes. It includes in our marriages and uh, the family unit. The devil wants to break down the family. You know, the LGBT agenda is not just about being homosexual. It's about the destruction of the family unit. Divorce is about the destruction of the family unit. We talked about this a couple of weeks ago, and uh, I realize that that's an uncomfortable topic for many people. But let's just make up our minds that everyone that's sitting in this room right now, everyone that's listening online, everyone that's listening later, you're married, you stay that way. Amen? No divorce. There is no divorce in our vocabulary. We're going to rule it out. We're going to find a way to love. We're going to work our way through the difficulties, no matter what, till death do us part. The enemy wants to break down your marriage. He wants to break down your relationship with your kids. We should be praying about that. God, heal our family. He wants to break down your relationship with your grandkids. Some of your grandkids are growing up, and it's difficult. In these days, there's a lot of distraction. There's a lot of temptation. We are called to love. Now, that doesn't mean we compromise truth, but we are called to love. And we will pray to this end, that our love may abound. Number seven, continuing our way through the list, for the church leadership. Now, that's something that some of you pray about, and I know this is going to sound um, kind of selfish uh, coming from me, a church leader, but I want you to have a focus here. Don't just pray for me. 
Don't just pray for my wife. Don't just pray for our staff and their wives or husbands. Pray for all the church leaders around the globe. It's tough to be in the ministry these days. This morning in the first service, there was a couple of retired pastors, and I know there's a couple in the room today in this service. They will tell you it's tough. Sometimes burnout gets the best of you. And more than just the few that are around here, even in our couple of services this morning, but in the city, in the county, in the state, in the country, and around the globe, it's tough to be in the ministry. Today, more pastors are leaving the church in the the, the pulpits than we have Bible college students going to school to become pastors. Not all those that go to school to become pastors will become pastors. And we still have more leaving than wanting to come in. What does that tell you? That tells you in days to come, there's going to be fewer and fewer. And so the responsibility will be greater and greater. And we are called by God to pray for the leadership of the church, the elders, the deacons, the pastors. Hebrews chapter 13, verse 7 says, remember those who rule over you. Remember in this context uh, is to pray for them. In this this, uh, vernacular he uses remember, it means remember in your prayers. Remember those who rule over you, have spoken the word of God to you, whose faith follow, considering the outcome of their conduct. God has set in the church and established some perimeters and some, uh, some governing rules. And there is rulership and leadership. It's not a matter of pastoral control as in the shepherding movement, but accountability. Accountability to truth, accountability to lifestyle, accountability to doctrine. These things are important these days. And when we're dealing with behaviors and when we're dealing with doctrines, sometimes it gets tough and there's arguments. I told you the story once about a woman that was arguing with me about doctrine. And I said, well, let's just take a look at what the Bible says. And I opened my Bible and started reading to her. And before I could finish reading, she says, well, I just don't agree with that. I says, I didn't even give you my opinion yet. I'm still reading the Bible. And of course, she just closes right up. These things can be tough. It's tough on leaders. 2 Thessalonians chapter 3. Finally, brethren, pray for us that the word of the Lord may run swiftly and be glorified just as it is with you and that we may delivered from, be delivered from unreasonable and wicked men for not all have faith. So th- there's wicked men out there. It's not just pr- trouble within, it's trouble without. You know about the persecution that's going on around the world. We keep that in front of you all the time. But pray for us, Paul says, that the word of the Lord may run swiftly and be glorified just as it is with you. Number eight, that we may have discernment. We have a death of discernment, an intentional death of discernment in the day in which we live. People don't want to know what's right and wrong. And those that do know what's right and what's wrong are afraid to say what's right and what's wrong. And even if there are some that discover what is right and wrong, there are those that don't want there to be consequences for wrong. We need discernment. We need to be ready always to give an answer to everyone that asks of us for the hope that lies within us. We need to know the truth so that we can tell the truth. In a world that says, well, your truth is your truth and my truth is my truth. And I always say to them, give me your money. My truth is that you want to give me your money. All of it. And they well, that's not my truth. See, there's all kinds of contradictions in these silly logical uh, fallacies that are being communicated today. But if we don't think about them, there is a truth. Thou shalt not covet. Right? How about that for a truth? You don't steal your friend's stuff. You don't steal your neighbor's stuff, right? We should have discernment in doctrine. We should have discernment in the gifts of the Holy Spirit. I talk about that briefly today because of something that happened with me this past week. Um, There's an idea that the gifts have ceased, And uh, the person that was communicating this concept to me was a dispensationalist. 
And I said, look, if the gifts have ceased, then there's been a dispensational change somewhere that we didn't notice. And that, of course, throws off the dispensationalist. I am one. The gifts have not ceased. But I'll tell you what needs to cease is all the crazy stuff that people call gifts. Like all the drooling in the spirit that's going on. Hey, you, what? Drooling in the spirit? Yeah, well, unless you become like a child, you shall not inherit the kingdom. And so there's a group of people out there that are on the fringes of the charismatic movement where they say, well, the reason that we drool is because God gave us the spirit of a child, and so we drool. That's a great testimony. See, I want to get saved, man. Did you see that guy drooling the other day? That was awesome. <laughs> we need to have discernment about what the real gifts of the Spirit are and what this weird stuff is that's going on today. We have to have discernment. Proverbs chapter 2 says, My son, if you receive my words and treasure my commands within you so that you incline your ear to wisdom and apply your heart to understanding, yes, if you cry out for discernment and lift up your voice for understanding, if you seek her as silver and search for her as for hidden treasure, then you will understand the fear of the Lord and find the knowledge of God. We don't even have enough discernment to know who God is anymore in the churches. We have all kinds of funny ideas. We need to know the Lord, the truth. Number nine, for national leadership. Now, national leadership embraces local leadership. And guys, you know who the president is. Uh, you, you think about some of the other individuals that are in, in a, a national scale leadership, and we're called to pray for them. Sometimes we do. We say, God, break out their teeth, please. You know? Uh, but the thing is, how many of you even know the name of the mayor? See, I'm, I'm not asking you to raise your hand. I don't want to embarrass anybody. How about your city council members? How about the sheriff? Do you know the sheriff's name? How about the police chief? See, these are the things that we're being instructed to pray for, and yet they're neglected. We should be praying for the chief of police. We should be praying for the sheriff. And unless you know who they are, you won't. Now, sometimes generically, but I'm giving you some things that would otherwise fall off your prayer radar that we are called by God to pray for. 1 Timothy chapter 2, verses 1 through 4 reads this way. Therefore, I exhort, first of all, that prayers, intercessions, supplications, prayers, intercessions, and the giving of thanks be made for all men, for kings, for all who are in authority, that we may lead a quiet and peaceable life in all godliness and reverence. For this is good and acceptable in the sight of God our Savior, who desires all men to be saved and to come to the knowledge of the truth. Now, I mentioned to you earlier that in Peter, we have this reference, God's not slack concerning his promise, as some men count slackness, uh, but is long suffering toward us, not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. And in that context, all is the church, not in this passage. In this passage, let me read it again. I exhort first of all that supplications, prayers, intercession, and giving of thanks be made for all men. It's everybody. For kings, for all who are in authority, that we may lead a quiet and peaceable life in all godliness and reverence. For this is good and acceptable in the sight of God our Savior, who desires all men to be saved and to come to the knowledge of the truth. All men. Now, we know that not all men will be saved. God knows. But we're called. This is the only verse in the entire New Testament that tells you to pray for the unsaved to become saved. Did you know that? It's kind of an obscure thing, but there it is. But to pray for kings, people in authority. No matter who our next president is, we need to pray that that person will really know the Lord. Not only because they're our leader, but because they need to know the Lord. Amen? And finally, we are to pray for the coming of the Lord, His soon coming. 
we should have expectancy. Now, you're probably thinking, well, of course. I mean, we pray for the coming of the Lord. No, you don't. Most people don't. In fact, most people pray just the opposite. Did you know that? Most people, most Christians pray, Lord, please don't come yet. Now, especially teenagers. God, please, not until I have sex. <laughs> Lord, no, no, not until I can drive. I've got to be able to drive. I want to graduate, Lord. I got to get my degree. I want to be this. I want to be that. I want to do this. I want to do that. God, please don't come yet. What about baby boomer, baby busters? Oh, God, please don't come till my kid's saved. Now let's go up. Grandmas and grandpas. Oh, God, please don't come until my grandkids are saved. Now we invest in them, we love them, but you know what? God knows those that are his and he'll lose none of them. And that is what Peter was talking about when he said God is not slack concerning his promises. Some men count slackness, not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. He, he's, he's in our world delaying his coming because he knows those that are going to be saved from before the foundations of the world. And in the time continuum, somewhere along the way in the wisdom of God, he allows people like you, like me, to come to a place where we recognize who God is and we exercise faith in him and believe the gospel and are actually born again. That happens to you in time. Now, God knows from before time began who those people are. And so there is not one place in the New Testament that tells us, pray that God will wait. Wow, that's bizarre. And yet that's the great majority of our praying. Trust me, the guy that's being tortured for Christ is not praying, God, please wait. In the big picture of the scripture, knowing the sovereignty of God, that he knows those that are his and he will lose none of them, we don't have to pray, God, please wait. We are, in fact, instructed, pray for the coming of the Lord. Revelation chapter 22, verse 20 through 21 says, He who testifies to these things says, Surely I am coming quickly. Who's the one that's testifying? Jesus. He says, I am coming quickly. Amen. Even so, come Lord Jesus, says the Spirit via John. So the Holy Spirit inspires John to write, even so, come. That's the way we're supposed to pray. Jesus, come quickly. And you guys... We are addicted to the world. We are addicted to our own strength. We are addicted to our ability. But when we truly humble ourselves before God and persevere in that humility and in that dependence on God, we will have so much peace because we know that God is going to do all that is in his heart to do and according to his good pleasure and no one can thwart his plan. And therefore, we can pray, Lord, come. And he'll probably be the one saying, not yet, not yet. Until he says it's time. Young people. All the things that you think that you want the Lord to delay his coming so that you can experience. Let me just say, when you see him face to face, you will know that he is better. He's better than graduating, better than driving, better than the other stuff I mentioned. And so we pray, God, come. And so as believers, we're dependent on the Lord. And the reason we're dependent is because we recognize our neediness. That's humility. We say, God, I can't, but you can. And therefore, I'm going to persist in prayer. Not because I know that if I beg you long enough, you'll finally cave in. 
but because it's a demonstration of my humility before you and my dependence upon you, knowing that you will fulfill all your good pleasure, but that you look only to me for one thing, surrender, trust. And the byproduct is peace, which comes by grace. Amen? Amen. And so the, may the Lord allow us more and more every day to be a, a people humble and dependent upon him. May we have a greater level of trust as we serve him, knowing that he's going to work all things according to the counsel of his will. He will fulfill all his good pleasure. And that as we pray, Lord, come, he isn't slack concerning his promises. Some men count slackness, but is long-suffering toward us, not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance, waiting for the precious harvest of the, of the church age, the bride of Christ. And when we start thinking, well, I don't want the Lord to come soon because I'm going to be ashamed when he sees me. I want you to know that he is already in Christ presented you faultless and blameless before him at his coming because you are a people who continue in faith. You trust him. That he washed your sins away. They've been cast as far as the east is from the west. To be remembered no more. There is not a day coming when you're going to stand before the Lord and you're going to feel ashamed because He's going to play back the tape of your life. Or he's going to remind you of all your weaknesses and shortcomings. Now, I will admit to you that the second we see him, in an instant we will know and we'll be humble. But God isn't going to be the one that turns a light on our sin. He's going to be the one that says, grace. He's going to be the one that says, I saved you in spite of you. Oh, I knew all that before I saved you. I've loved you with an everlasting love. Nothing will separate you from my love. That's the gospel. That's the good news. No front loading. I got to clean myself up so that God will accept me. No back loading. I got to do all this stuff so God will keep me. Just trust him. And rest in his grace. In Jesus name. Amen. Father, thank you for this time. Send us forth today in celebration in your grace and peace, in your truth, in Jesus' name. Amen. God bless you guys. If this message has been a blessing, won't you please consider partnering with us? Send a financial gift of any size to Candlelight Fellowship, P.O. Box 2555, Hayden, Idaho, 83835. Join Pastor Paul Van Oy each Sunday and Wednesday for our online service or in person at 5725 North Pioneer Drive in beautiful Coeur d'Alene, Idaho. For service times and sermon recordings, visit candlelight.org.